Hello and welcome to New Central Now, coming to you live from our studios in Lagos, the economic capital of Nigeria. I'm Suleiman Alede, and here are the top stories of this hour. Nigeria police gets new police boss. Now, judicial workers in Nigeria begin indefinite strike. South Sudan begins mass vaccination campaign. Details and more after now. We we'll begin in southern Africa, where Zimbabwe is close to rejoining the Commonwealth of Nations as re-engagement efforts continue to bear fruits. The country is already in the second stage of the application process. In May of 2018, President Emerson Nangagwa wrote to the Commonwealth Secretary General, Patricia Scotland, expressing Zimbabwe's willingness to return to the group after nearly two decades of isolation. The new administration led by Nangagwa is opening Zimbabwe for business and is eager to end the isolation of the country on a global stage. For more on this, I am now being joined by Ivan Vava. He is the executive director of Crisis Coalition in Zimbabwe. Good to have you join me, Ivan. Now, in 2018, uh, Zimbabwe applied to rejoin the Commonwealth 15 years after it quit the organization of former British colonies. Uh, has anything changed since then? Well, uh, nothing much uh, has changed uh, in terms of uh, the situation on the ground. Yes, of course, uh, President Nangagwa and his administration are desperate uh, to be back uh, in uh, the, the League of uh, Nations, that is the Commonwealth, also trying to end uh, Zimbabwe's isolation. Uh, you know that uh, in 2000, uh, Zimbabwe was slapped with sanctions by the U.S., uh, and also by the European Union, and subsequently, 2003, they exited uh, the, the Commonwealth. But uh, what we are seeing on the ground uh, since Emerson Mnangagwa took over from Robert Mugabe is that there has been, uh, in fact, an escalation of human rights abuses, uh, corruption, uh, the lack of uh, reforms, uh, the entrenchment or the attempt to entrench a one-party state system, uh, and also uh, the closure of democratic space, the closure of civil space. So nothing much has really changed uh, for Zimbabwe. Uh, and it's quite uh, sad uh, that uh, this government is an appetite of continuing with this while it's not uh, doing uh, reforms on the ground. As you know, that uh, after the takeover of government in November 2017, they promised a new dispensation. They promised... Uh, to end uh, years of uh, abuse. They also promised a change uh, in, in the manner of, on, on how the country was being governed. Uh, so in a way, we can say that uh, what to do for them to be readmitted again uh, into the Commonwealth. So Ivan, you say nothing uh, significantly has changed uh, since uh, uh, Emerson Nangagwa took over from uh, Robert Mugabe. Uh, now, what are the benefits of joining the Commonwealth? Uh, to the average Zimbabwean, since, uh, according to you, nothing significant has happened? Well, uh, if we look at how the Commonwealth is structured, um, I think that uh, the, the benefits for us and for the ordinary uh, person, apart from uh, you know, the, free, the free movement in terms of uh, the visa regimes uh, and educational and business opportunities, uh, I don't think that there isn't much uh, that uh, is said to benefit uh, the ordinary person. But apart from Emerson Nangagwa sprucing his image that uh, now they're being accepted, the Commonwealth might mean uh, that his government or the way that, uh, in fact, it, it might mean that uh, his government has been reforming. It might also mean uh, that Zimbabwe has had much to end its isolation. Remember that uh, we were isolated mainly because of the human rights abuses, mainly also because of the chaotic land reform process program that happened in the early 2000s. On the scale, how would you now rate the present administration on human rights issues? 
I think that uh, on a scale of up to 10, uh, obviously they are below five. We actually saw a decrease, a, a, in fact, an increase in terms of the human rights abuses uh, as compared to the time that Robert Mugabe was in office, in that uh, for the first time uh, in three years of uh, Emerson Mnangagwa taking over, we've had more than 20, at least 20 people being charged with treason, of which in Mugabe's 37 years, only five people have been charged with treason. Uh, in the three years that they were in government, we've had uh, hundreds of arrests, of activists uh, jailed today. We also witnessed the first uh, conviction, a proper conviction of a human rights uh, activist, Makumbari Arasubishi, was slept with a 14-month uh, jail term for whistling, for demonstrating, which only shows that uh, things have gone from bad to worse as compared to the time that uh, Mugabe was there for the past eight, seven years. This government's appetite to trample uh, human rights, this government's appetite to entrench a dictatorship, this government's appetite to loot corruption, uh, it has gone to unprecedented levels. Ivan Havava, many thanks for unpacking this for us on the news. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nigeria's federal government has appointed a new head for its police force. The Minister of Police Affairs says the appointment of Deputy Inspector General of Police, Al-Kali Baba, followed a thorough process. Mr. Baba replaces the outgoing Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, whose tenure ended on February 1. The Police Affairs Minister says the process is in line with the extant laws and the Constitution of Nigeria. The tenure of the IGP Muhammad Adamu, which ended on 1st February 2021, was extended by Mr. President uh, to enable a detailed process of appointing a new IG in line with Section 15A of the 1999 Constitution. After a thorough check of a short list of suitably qualified police officers, from the rank of DIGs and AIGs who are eligible police officers who are eligible for appointment as IGP in line with section 7 subsection 2 of the Nigeria Police Act 2020 and having regard to seniority professionalism record of service and competence Mr President has approved the appointment of an acting AIG, uh, an acting IGP in the person of Usman Al Ali Baba, PSC, FDC, with immediate effect. No doubt Mr. Baba has a lot on its plate as another attack on a police station has been recorded in. Nigeria's southeastern state of Imo. The latest incident at Ehim Imbano local government area comes a day after gunmen attacked a prison facility and police headquarters in the state capital, Oweri. Uh, Tuesday's attack comes a few hours after the vice president, Yemi Oshibajo, visited the scene of Monday's attack and hours after the presidency announced the replacement of the inspector general of police, Mohamed Adamu. Now, the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria has embarked on a nationwide strike today, Tuesday, April 6. The strike in judiciary workers are demanding for financial autonomy of the judiciary. New Central's Omolola Ololade visited the Lagos High Court and has this report. The Judicial Staff Union of Nigeria, JUSON, for some years have been in the forefront of the battle for financial independence. The nation's judiciary today embarked on an indefinite nationwide strike to press home their demands for financial autonomy. We're here live at the Lagos State High Court, TBS Annex, in Lagos, Nigeria. And as you can see, what used to be a beehive of activities has turned to a deserted place. And that is because of the ongoing strike by the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, JUSON. Joining me now is the National Deputy President of the Association, Comrade Emmanuel Abioye. Well, the reason for the strike is very simple. Um, we're agitating. 
we are not happy okay. and want action. We demand for the implementation of the Section 121, subsection 3 particularly, of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, which give um, the financial autonomy to the judiciary, not only in uh, Lagos states, but throughout the Federation. And that is exactly what they're agitating for. We have been on this for a while. We went to court to get the judgment of court 2014 precisely. And um, I mean, up to now, there is no implementation, there is no execution of that judgment. The courtesy of whoever, they are frustrating that judgment. As to whether it is the right timing for the strike, the national deputy president of Jusan has this to say. We expect the stakeholders to react. Um, we want to say clearly that we are not taking this action for the, uh, because we want people to be affected negatively, especially MBA. However, much as he has said about timing, uh, well, timing of execution of judgments, there's has never been any time that is so, uh, you know, so, so ripe. Even though union understands the implication of the strike on litigations and court proceedings, they also say the strike must commence as it has been long overdue. The national deputy president also said they will not back down until demands are met. No dedicated worker will want to be on strike, but definitely, I mean, what do we do? That's last resort. We have, we have tried to find a way around it, but look as if, I mean, the government are not hearing us loudly. Until when we speak out now in this manner, that the government, they have the, the, the uh, discretion to let us know when they want us to, uh, you know, go back to work as soon as they comply with the provision of the law. Jisan strike comes about one week after the National Association of Resident Doctors also embarked on an indefinite industrial action, and Nigerians have begun to raise eyebrows at the government. While well, still on industrial actions, Nigeria's academic staff union of polytechnics has blamed the federal government for its strike action, which began today. The union's national president, Anderson Ezebe, says the federal government has failed to live up to its promise to address the rot in infrastructure in the country's polytechnics and monotechnics. Now, Ezebe says members of the union are still waiting for the federal government to fulfill a promise it made four years ago to release about 25 billion naira to improve infrastructure in polytechnics across the country. Unfortunately, the depth of infrastructure over the years has led to a serious gap. And that was what led to the setting up of a needs assessment team. The same way that the universities were visited, uh, within the same period, polytechnics, public polytechnics and colleges of technology in Nigeria were also visited. In 2017, when our union went on strike, the Honorable Minister seated here did so much and so well in assuring us that a revitalization fund was going to be made available to the sector to the tune of 25 billion. In fact, we went as far as documents were presented to us to the fact that the release of these funds were in process. And this was supposed to be done in lieu of the implementation of the needs assessment report. Four years down the line, no public polytechnic or college of technology in the country has received any form of funds under this subhead of revitalization. The president has approved the council for all the polytechnics, and I think we are just waiting for this this type break to pass. I believe they will be released immediately. If you will be called for the meeting of the rapid reform committee in the shortest possible time. I give you my shadows that they will all be attended to the dispatch. In the meantime, the number of Nigerians being repatriated from Saudi Arabia in the last three days has risen to over a thousand. The director of consular and legal department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Bolaji and Kiremi, said uh, 653 returnees arrived to Nigeria in the last two days. 
He told News Central that Nigerian missions abroad are always ready to help Nigerians with immigration issues in any part of the world. Well, these are a combination of several things. Uh, a lot of them uh, certainly of, uh, uh, they were with, without authorization in their host countries. Uh, and many of them were trafficked and uh, some of them were stranded uh, after the lockdown and their visas got expired. And so they were also in the protection center. And um, all of them, it was a party period, it was a mixture of all the categories of returnees and some of them were deported for one crime or the other. And so we, we have all of them involved. Now there is little you can do when you are in the hand of uh, your host uh, uh, police or security because there is protocol that, 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 that guide all this. You have to write to them officially. And most of the people who have already been arrested do not have access to telephone. They probably have someone to call and then it's getting the third party. But there are protocols we follow uh, in diplomatic circle. Whenever your national is in uh, either prison or is in detention, you write officially to the host and then you are, you are granted access to them. And then you can take care of their welfare. Uh, you can cater for them if it is allowed. In some While staying in West Africa, eight people have been killed in the latest attack in Burkina Faso. Three police personnel and five members of a civilian anti-jihadist force were killed when joint units of gendarmes and volunteers for the defense of the motherland came under attack in Goma province. The attack was confirmed by security sources who said the joint patrol was attacked by several dozen men on motorbikes. Now, the head of the United Nations peacekeepers in Mali has expressed concern over the security situation in Mali. Jean-Pierre Lacroix uh, made his concerns known to the UN Security Council on Tuesday, saying the Blue Helmets, the Malian Defense and Security Forces continue to suffer repeated attacks and significant losses. He added that several regions and large towns are living under constant threat from armed groups. He also condemned a terrorist attack on Friday where four Chadian peacekeepers were killed and 34 others wounded. The assault uh, was a tragedy and an illustration of the bravery and determination of our peacekeepers to support the people of Mali, he said. Now, in East Africa, Kenya has launched a security operation against bandits in the northwestern counties, mostly inhabited by pastoralists. The Rift Valley Regional Commissioner George Natembeya said multiple attacks in the region forced the state to carry out an operation to weed out criminals and retrieve illegal firearms in the hands of civilians. Natembeya said the government early this month suspended an operation to mop up guns from residents in the northwest counties after local leaders called for a ceasefire. However, interventions by political leaders who had requested for a one-month ceasefire to engage the locals had failed to yield results. Now to Mozambique, where the Southern African Development Community is expected to hold a meeting on Thursday in the capital Maputo to discuss ways to tackle the insurgency bedeviling the Southeast African nation. The SADC expressed deep concern about the continued terrorist attacks in Cabo Delgado especially for the lives and welfare of the residents who continue to suffer from the brutal and indiscriminate assaults. The extraordinary double Troika summit will see representatives from Botswana, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, Tanzania and Mozambique meet. And after the meeting, a communique on the key outcomes of the summit will be issued on the deliberations. Coming up. South Sudan begins COVID-19 mass vaccination. Details of these and more when we return. Stay with us. South Sudan today rolled out its COVID-19 mass vaccination drive on joining, uh, joining the world's efforts to tackle the pandemic through inoculations. Healthcare workers in Juba were among the first to receive their jabs of the AstraZeneca vaccine. 
But the elderly persons also targeted South Sudan's top government officials are also expected to take their jabs soon. The vaccination drive comes nearly two weeks after the arrival of the shots in the country. South Sudan received the 132,000 doses of the AstraZeneca shorts on March 25 through the support of the World Health Organization's COVAX facility established to ensure all countries can equitably access COVID-19 vaccines. Now, South Africa has signed an agreement with Pfizer Incorporated for 20 million dollar shots of COVID-19 vaccine doses, boosting plans to start mass vaccinations from April. The deal is another stimulus for the country's effort in its fight against the coronavirus pandemic. After the Pfizer deal, the government will have enough to vaccinate roughly 41 million people out of its total population of 60 million. Deputy Director General at South Africa's Department of Health, Anban Pile, says the first batch of the Pfizer vaccine is expected to arrive later in April. He did not comment on the price. The government is buying the JNJ vaccine uh, for $10 per dose. Now, Zambia will review its response to the COVID-19 in order to analyze the strength and weaknesses. Minister of Health Jonas Chanda said the review of the multi-sectoral response was critical in preparing for the probable third wave anticipated to occur during the cold month of June and July. The Zambian minister said the ministry has continued to explore additional options for vaccine acquisition through its three pillar strategy. He says Zambia is closely following the outbreak of the third wave in some countries and putting in place measures that may avert or reduce the impact of the third wave. The country has recorded over a thousand COVID-19 related deaths. The World Health Organization has reiterated that vaccination passports may not be an effective strategy for restarting travel. Now, in a speech ahead of World Health Day on April 7, WHO spokesperson Dr. Margaret Harris said the UN Health Agency would not like to see vaccination passports as a requirement for entry or exit because it is not sure at this stage that the vaccine prevents transmissions. For World Health Day, the UN agency has urged countries to build a fairer, healthier, post-COVID-19 world. Now, recently, Russia hosted some African countries in its second investment summit and is looking for directions and opportunities in terms of industrial and investment cooperation. As it stands now, Russia's annual trade volume with Sub-Saharan Africa has doubled over the last five years, as it has divested into the non-energy sector, among others. Earlier, Søren Vandanya, vice president of the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Industry, was on Business Edge. He sheds more light on this. Have done a very interesting steps in new technologies. And I want to say that uh, Moscow also uh, grew its uh, export to Africa for 7%. And uh, now it's about 2 and 4.4 billion dollars. It's Moscow companies. And I want to say that on it's already, uh, Moscow has 22% in non-energy, non-resources export of Russian Federation, or before okay. Russia. Oh, and the news with this incredible story of Aminat Idris, who despite being eight months pregnant, went on to win gold medal at the ongoing National Sports Festival held, uh, being held in Niger's southwestern state of Edo. Idris was victorious in the mixed Ponce category. She was representing the southwestern state of Lagos at a tournament. Just take a look. A karate kid in the making, you would say. 
That's the news of this hour, but before we go, let's take another look at some of the top stories. A new Inspector General of Police has been appointed in Nigeria. Judicial workers in Nigeria have begun an indefinite strike. And finally, we told you that South Sudan has begun its mass vaccination campaign. Follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also catch up with our news and programs. Just download the New Central TV mobile app on Play Store and iOS. You can also watch us live on Star Times, Channel 274. I'm Suleiman. I'll many thanks for watching.